Thank you. I'm completely humbled by that extraordinary introduction, and I just want to say I'm so happy to be at this amazing conference. It's amazing. The energy here is amazing. Um, and just greetings to every activist, community leader, um, artist, lover of earth and life, and bravo to Bravo to Kenny and Nina for creating this amazing thing. They, and just bravo, bravo. I had originally planned today to give another talk, you might have noticed in the program. But in the process of preparing for today, in the process of dreaming and thinking and reflecting, something magical and unexpected happened. I'm not sure if I would characterize it as a memory or a revelation or a series of intermingling events that catalyzed a vision about something I have been struggling to understand most of my life. Whatever it was, it became clear as the story began to unfold that it was the only thing I could talk about today. So let me go back to Eve, first woman, Adam, serpent, apple, garden, God. <laughs> I take you back there because that's where this story begins. I have been obsessed with Eve my whole life. First of all, it was my name. And to be honest, for a six-year-old, it seemed ridiculously impossible to be named Eve. She was not only responsible for the downfall of paradise, expulsion, sin, shame, but death itself. <laughs> Names like myths determine a lot. In a deep sense, I belong to that story of Adam and Eve. It was like a tectonic plate at the bedrock of my consciousness, engendering how I saw myself and how I behaved in the world. And I believe, consciously or unconsciously, that story has shaped a great deal of humanity. How many of us feel we are, quote, fallen women, people, our inherent credibility or value erased upon birth? How many of us are controlled by the debilitating terror that any form of disobedience or independence will lead to social exclusion and damnation. How many of us feel cursed for our curiosity, forbidden to know what we know, living amidst a culture constantly manifesting a pathological and patronizing distrust and disdain for our instincts, delegitimizing our intuition, or belittling anything that might lead to a deeper, more embodied intelligence? The myth of Eve has served as eternal warning, electric fence around our psyches, zapping our impulses to revolt or question. I don't know about you, but the serpent has figured highly in my life in the form of sex, drugs, rock and roll. I think many of us have constantly been ingesting things that are stand-ins for apples, but always with a sense of being wrong. Our life force or hunger to be, our erotic impulses have been distorted through this cellular shame and distrust. Although this dominant story seems to rule our conscious life, if we stop and listen, we know there has always been another story gnawing at our collective subconscious, another idea of the archetypal mythic Eve. I've read biographies of her, many of them, and many feminist reinterpretations. My thought and vision, of course, rests inside and draws strength and particulars from them. Some have seen Eve as setting off to make the world according to her own experience. Some see Eve as deeply identified with her sexuality. Others see her as more intelligent, more compelling, confident, coveting wisdom. I think it is crucial how we see Eve. She was, in theory, in this particular story, the first woman, the mother of life. And although she is a character in a parable, we know myths rule our existence, determine the walls of the stories we live in, and the barriers of the ones we would like to construct. They become the architecture of our actions and lives. So I'm here today to present you with another story about Eve. It's my contributions to what John Lash calls the new mythos. I speak of her as archetype more than religious figure. I speak of her as one of many feminine archetypes who had deep influence over our lives. Eve ate the apple because, like many of us, she was trying to remember the other story. 
the story before the trauma of brainwashing and massacres. The story before they shoved things into our sacred holes and cut the tips of our clitorises, where divinity lives. Before they shaved our furry nests and choked the throat of our songs, before they called us hysterical and intense and emotional, before they beat boys for crying and wanting to wear dresses, before they stoned us for uttering the words of our mothers and drilled down into us to rob us of our moist and fertile secrets. Before Eve was made to believe she was taken from a rib, before she was forced to be obedient, before she stopped dancing as and in the undulations of stars and moon, before she stopped dancing. Before she bury, buried her powers to heal with touch and see the future and blend with land, before she knew how to pleasure herself over and over and over forever, and men knew they were there to serve that pleasure because as she was pleasured, they and the world were pleasured over and over and over forever. Before she was embarrassed by joy, before she apologized for her heart and stopped respecting the size of its brain, before she disqualified her opinions and apologized for in her insatiable curiosity, before childbirth became punishment, and love and service to a man became mandatory, before she swallowed her rage and choked her voice, before men established God the Father at the top, before there was a top, before the earth was treated as the wretched wild, before when it was life generating life in all directions. Eve ate the apple because the trajectory of her hunger was our way back. And the apple was the fruit of memory, the medicine of recall, the aphrodisiac of original connection. Eve ate the apple to regain her powers, to know what she knew before she got held hostage in the wrong garden. The Bible tells us that God said to Adam and Eve, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. I'm so happy that Paul spoke before me and I don't think it's accidental. Because certain scholars such as Gordon Wasson and Carl Ruck and Clark Heinrich have written that the mythological apple is a symbolic substitution for the ethnogenic Amanara mascara mushrooms. <laughs> you know the red ones with the white polka dots. When we look at an illustration of Adam and Eve from the 13th century, we see a very surprising image. Undeniably, the tree of knowledge is pictured as a mushroom here, and the serpent is wrapped around it. The serpent, who was Eve's deeper inner knowing, said, eat the red fruit and you will not die. And by the way, they didn't. God lied. The serpent said, your eyes will be open, and I believe their eyes were opened. And the apple or the mushroom corrected them, connected them directly to the divinity of the earth without the intermediate of God the Father. So Eve ate the apple and came into her full independent, erotic self and heart. And what did she do next? She generously, generously offered this transformation to Adam, because that's what women do. And immediately, punishment, shame, guilt, oppression descended upon them. They were expelled, and they have been wandering inside us and outside us, trying to remember ever since. Eve was cast out as she opened the door to the deeper knowing, and all of us must be okay outside our father's garden, outside his house, outside the world of disembodied intelligence. We must all now be visionary nomads, exiled from the hierarchy and ready to find each other and create the new world, which is really just remembering the world from which we came. 
Eve ate, the, Eve ate the apple to remember the time before our souls were straitjacketed and militarized by religions that rendered us defeated, guilty, sinful, waiting for someone or something, usually a father god or consumer god, coming to rescue us or redeem us or protect us, when in fact there was nothing to be rescued from except those who are in our name committing wars and violence protecting us. Eve, who knew we didn't need a soldier of paradise or a mythic corporate daddy, who has occupied our imagination and our days into passive projects of waiting, 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 while those who use his name pillage and hoard the goods. Eve, who knew paradise didn't need to be carried in on a white horse or descend in an illumined cloud, because in fact, paradise was already here. And our project, rather than waiting for paradise to be delivered, was instead to develop the capacity and vision to recognize and appreciate the paradise already here. The paradise not constructed on hierarchy and competition and domination and greed, but on connection and mutual cooperation. The paradise that grew from the earth herself, our mother, delivering everything humans needed and beyond anything they could have dreamed. And God said, Adam and Eve, you will have dominion over the earth. Subdue her and multiply. Eve knew in her body memory that this was the greatest misconception and violation and would send the story of the world exactly where it has gone, to dominate and occupy and subdue our mother, our earth, who was not only feeding us, but who was in fact us. That this separation from her, lacerated by the brutal, power-hungry, conceptual machete of those who turned Satan into the devil, Eve into the initiator of original sin, and the earth herself into a mad, devouring, and terrifying demon who had to be tamed and controlled. This separation that exiled us from the inherent life-sustaining umbilicus of our green mother left us hungry and searching to return to her body, our bodies. The hunger which has made us vulnerable to tyranny, more concerned with acceptance and approval than resisting ongoing violations and atrocities committed on humanity and the earth. <laughs> that hunger that has led to dramatic and contemporary addictions, drugs, food, shopping, sex, all overcompensating for the desperation to be one with nature and in turn ourselves. The separation that was enacted and enforced by violence on our bodies, because as Eve knew, it is in our bodies where the memory lives. The only way to forget was to force us out of our bodies, to rape them, to beat them, to torture them, to bully them, to threaten them, and then to commit the same heinous acts on our Mother Earth while forcing us what felt to be like helpless spectators of this holy destruction. And after, in our horror, we not only fled our own bodies, but the violated and stigmatized body of the mother, and in her place we turned in our desperation and terror for protection and sustenance to the perpetrators themselves. May I remind us that Eve did not ask God or Adam for permission. She knew exactly what she had to do, and I believe she must have known at least instinctively what could follow. She knew she risked disapproval, and somewhere in her she must have known her legacy, legit legitimacy, and name could be ruined and she would be expelled from the comforting mirage and garden of patriarchy. But may I remind us, this didn't stop her. She was our whistleblower, knowing she was in the wrong garden.
She ate the apple, chewed and swallowed it into her body, absorbed it into her bloodstream like a kind of medicine, like a kind of potion, a sweet red flesh ball of remembering. She ate the apple because her hunger for justice, ecstasy, connection, pleasure, equality, and love was massively alive in her. And as Audre, Light, Audre Lorde writes in her visionary piece, The Uses of the Erotic, as women, we have come to distrust that power which rises from our deepest and non-rational knowledge. We have been warned against it our whole lives by the male world, which values the step of feeling enough to keep women around in order to exercise it in service of men, but which fears the same depth too much to examine the possibilities of it within themselves. Of course, women, erotic women so empowered, are dangerous. Eve is alive in us. I can feel her today, her hunger for memories. She is in our mother body, and I truly believe we are on the brink of the remembering. So how do we remember? What will jigger the flashbacks, images, sensations? First, we must unashamedly, openly eat the apple. This involves ingesting all that catalyzes and provokes vision and imagination. It means educating ourselves and looking deeper into the stories and myths designed and sustained by the powers that be. Reintroducing ritual, poetry, time, human connection, plant medicines, opening the box, learning the data, touching the mystical, coming out of denial, coming into our bodies through touch, dance, lots of sex, trusting what we know, not asking permission, defying authority. It means honoring and protecting our whistleblowers, our indigenous who blew the whistle this week on the myth of Columbus and changed Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden, who are the truly great people of this time, who blew the whistle on the NSA. Our brothers and sisters in Ferguson, who blew the whistle on police brutality and racism. These are our eaves. These are our whistleblowers. It means trusting our methods of remembering. And I want to take a minute to talk about dance. And I want to talk about the power of dance. As many of you know, one out of three women on the planet will be raped or beaten in her lifetime, which is, is so absurd, it's even hard, it's just even unfathomable. That's a billion women. Two years ago, when we invited the women of the world and all the men who love them to rise and dance to end violence against women, it was extraordinary what happened. Survivors, activists, everywhere. It was an invitation, immediately responded in 207 countries, and millions and millions of people broke out and danced. They didn't ask a question about what dance was. But there were the skeptics, particularly in the media and the corporatized institutions, who kept saying, well, what's dancing? What does dancing do? What's that going to do for anything? What's dancing? As if the ramblings and operations of their so-called empirically based empire had delivered us up another world other than this one on the brink of human extinction. I want to talk about the power of dancing, the power of what happens to a woman's body which has been traumatized by the state or domestic violence, bodies collectively releasing, expanding, joining, and resistance, dancing, women and men, it got them to reclaim and re-energize public space, which had been absolutely something they were exiled from. It spun and it splashed creative and compassionate and determined energy in every direction. It made violence against women a front page issue. It allowed for autonomy and local organizing and global solidarity all at the same time. It evoked demands for justice across a swath of intersectional issues, understanding that violence towards women cannot be separated from all the other violences, whether they be economic, environmental, racial, or gender. We are in the same story. It added joy to the ingredients of our resistance 
And by doing so, it added sexuality and it evoked the mystical and intangible, producing what seemed like miracles. In Peru, for example, where there's a lot of development and a lot of sexual harassment on the street, the construction workers joined forces with One Billion Rising there, and they turned every construction site into a sexually harassment-free construction site. In India, due to the extraordinary feminists there, they did gender sensitivity training as part of One Billion Rising, and they educated over 100,000 rickshaw drivers, who now on their rickshaws have a button that says, my religion is respecting women. It forced the government of the Philippines to protect the girls in the Paietas. The Paietas are the dump sites in, in the Philippines where people are literally living in garbage. There is a mountain of garbage. And the, the, the women are granted through a permit, if you can believe this, the right to scavenge. If they're lucky, they may get a piece of plastic that will bring them a dollar that they get to wash in a toxic river. But the girls, the young girls, couldn't afford to pay the permit. So they were selling their body, eight-year-old girls, in the morning to the truck drivers to get a right to scavenge. One Billion Rising changed that. And now the girls are protected and there's a watchdog, and we hope next year we're going to move people into another way of making a living. In Zimbabwe, the One Billion Rising and the dancing freed many women for prisons who had been held there for killing their perpetrators. It inspired men throughout the Congo to write a declaration of solidarity to end violence against women and girls across the world. And then they followed up with the national gathering that I got to attend, which was one of the most beautiful events I've ever seen. Men coming from across Congo to stand up for women and girls and to redefine masculinity. It's now collaborating One Billion Rising with restaurant workers in this country, fighting to end substandard pay, which directly licenses the highest level of sexual harassment in any industry. And I really believe we can win on this, and I urge all of you to stand with restaurant workers in this country. It led Haitian actors a few weeks ago to perform the vagina monologues in Creole in the Haitian parliament. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most revolutionary things I have ever seen. It bodily and boldly insisted on the implementation of laws to prevent sexual violence there. Dancing broke taboos and compelled women. The first action last year was women in Byron Bay, Australia, who stripped off their clothes and threw themselves into the sea. Women danced at factories, in front of corporations, in churches, but mainly it allowed women and men to come back into their bodies to reclaim public space so they, like Eve, could begin to remember the world we know inside us that we manifest outside us. It escalated ecstatic revolt. For years, a certain scene in Paradise Lost used to haunt me, in Milton's Paradise Lost. The Archangel Michael is standing with Adam and Eve at the edge of garden right before their expulsion. He says to them, good out of evil will be a higher good than e'er before. For years I took this to mean that we needed Eve to commit the sin of curiosity and disobedience. We needed her to bring an end to paradise because good without a knowledge of evil is a lesser good than good that overcomes evil. But I think Milton got it wrong. I think Eve already knew the higher good. I think she had the knowledge just like us in her body. She just needed to get out of that system, stop tiptoeing around that punishing and oppressive garden in order to get enough distance from the terror and trauma of the father, state, corporate machine, get around like-minded people, get enough confidence and support to remember the first story. And that's what we're doing here. By the way, this was one of the truly genius functions of Occupy Wall Street, to have a public, subversive play, pl 
place for group remembering and redesigning. We need many more of them. We need them everywhere. Gardens of reimagination. And Bioneers is such an amazing garden. We are stuck in the patriarchal, contaminated, capitalist, devastated garden, obeying the corporate daddy god, still living as if he has our interests at heart, as if the so-called paradise, without reflection or awareness in a somnolent state, seductive consumerist, near totalitarian surveillance, corporately owned media, celebrity void culture, internet voyeurs and bullying is real or keeping us safe. <laughs> Eve knew it was a mirage. She craved the real garden, the original garden, before the father god implanted his hierarchy and the violence and threat of punishment needed to sustain it. I just finished a wonderful biography of Emma Goldman by Vivian Gornick, and I suggest you all read it. For those of you who don't know her, you should be ashamed. <laughs> At one time, she was known as the most dangerous woman in America, a title we should all aspire to. <laughs> An anarchist, a revolutionary, she was most famous for her quote, if I can't dance, I'm not coming to your revolution. <laughs> in the biography, Gornick writes, felt is the operative word. Emma always claimed that the ideas of anarchism were of secondary use if grasped only with reasoning intelligence. It was necessary to feel them in every fiber like a flame, a consuming fever, an elemental passion. Goldman's radicalism and impassioned faith lived in the nervous system that feelings were everything. If revolutionaries gave up sex and art while they were making the revolution, she said, they would be devoid of joy. Without joy, human beings cease being human. So how do we build movements that are grown from loving life, fighting for life, love, pleasure, and joy? How do we make radical, outrageous, pushing the edge art and music that mainlines our thinking and passions into the masses? How do we keep evolving and surprising and deepening, getting closer and closer to the root? How do we shut up and serve? Be more concerned with expanding than branding, with following the multitudes than the messiahs. Be present for our allies without dominating them. Find resources for those without access to resources, without controlling how they use them. Stop using money as a weapon, but realize if you have some money to give away, you're lucky, not special, and no one needs to jump through hoops for it because you don't have a hoop, you have money. <laughs> Eve was a radical. And why I love that word radical as it means going to the roots. This is the time for radical change. This is the time to come into our bodies and dance and drum and rise. This is the time to stop apologizing for our belief that it is possible to live in a world where everyone gets fed, taken care of, where we leave the rest of the oil in the ground, where those who do the hardest work are honored and paid the most, where we take our direction and inspiration from the most marginalized and invisible, where we trust our imaginations that once lined up in the direction of life will begin to create rapid and astounding solutions where we transform human suffering not by more incarceration, punishment and degradation, but investigation into root causes. Where we, st <laughs> where we stop celebrating and becoming passive participants to celebrity royalty, famous money, fame as our models, but instead honor and highlight those who humbly and without resources transform and lift their communities. Where we trust the mystical, where we trust the mystical, the emotional and erotic as much as we trust the intellectual and political and understand that their integration is not only the catalyst for revolution, but it may in fact be the revolution itself. Where we come to know, and I say this from the deepest sense, that humility is the path to revolution and service is the only song. This year it's one billion rising revolution. This is the time to come out of our silos, our movement ghettos, and understand that each struggle for justice 
environmental, racial, indigenous, feminist, gender, we can go down the list, workers, economic, is a piece of a whole structure. And rather than being cauterized and divided, which they have done from the top, by our hunger for resources and spotlight, we give up dominion and fiercely and joyfully embrace the interconnectedness of every one of these things. There is no competition of suffering, only the joining into a single river of outrage, compassion, and revolt. This is the time to remake the structure, to reclaim the original garden, and remember, the tree of life, the offering of apples or mushrooms, was there inside the patriarchal garden. It has always been within us. In the end, it's about people, respect, love, honoring, cherishing, valuing life and people, and our mother, Earth. We are Eve's children, Eve, revolutionary, Eve who ate the apple that unearthed the first garden under the imposed and constructed garden. Eve who ate the apple as her hunger for truth was our actual path, and now we must fulfill her legacy. Eve, mother of our freedom, ate the apple to liberate us into the world, our world. This is our time. Eat the apple, eat the fucking apple, not the GMO kind. Share it with your Adam, share it with Asali, with your beloved, and remember, revolution! <laughs>